of the greatest ways we find humor is through unpredictability. You don't laugh at riding a bike, but when your friend crashes, you crack up. There's even an entire TV show dedicated to, doc to documenting that. Luckily for us, some people recognized this and created their own comedy troupe, eventually making several movies that are now classics. They were called Monty Python. The show was written, directed, and produced by Graham Chapman, Eric Idle, Terry Jones, Michael Palin, Terry Gilliam, and John Cleese. Coincidentally, this was also the cast. They wanted to reinvent the traditional ideas of comedy by approaching it in an unpredictable, aggressive, and irreverent way. Eventually, they did in 1969. Skip ahead to 71. The Python's first movie has just been released. They've received three BAFTA awards and two special awards for writing and graphics performance. After this initial success, the group's career seemed to be winding down as they explored new media. So they, re they released their second movie in 1975. It was a box office hit in Europe and America. Monty Python and the Holy Grail instantly became a cult classic all over the world as its unbounded silliness captured audiences. It still remains a staple in pop culture as one of the greatest comedies of all time. It also brought us some really great lines. These include the great, I fart in your general direction, and it is merely a flesh wound. <laughs> And you can't forget the swallow question either. It's really great, and I'll get into that later. <laughs> For those of you who don't know Monty Python and the Holy Grail, it tells the story of King Arthur, who, get this, he's searching for the Holy Grail. <laughs> Accompanying him are his loyal knights of the round table, who he, who he acquires in the beginning of the film. The movie chronicles their quest, and sometimes add in Terry Gilliam's unforgettable cartoons. King Arthur, as it is, takes part in every scene where the swallow question appears. Why? As he puts it, you have to know these things when you're a king, you know? <laughs> this helps with the notion of bad luck for the king of the Britons, as he continuously encounters the swallow. The question appears in two forms during the movie. In the very beginning, two soldiers who are apparently bird fanatics argue over how a coconut could have gotten to Marseille. Arthur unknowingly starts this conversation, as his loyal servant is clapping together two coconut halves for a horse-like sound. You guys got a preview of that earlier. The second part comes in at scene 23, The Bridge of Death. After posing several easy questions and some that just can't be answered, the bridge keeper comes to the king. As opposed to earlier questions of color preference, Arthur gets the famous, What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Well, what do you mean, an African or European swallow? I decided to find out just what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow. <laughs> yeah, that's the projects you want to do in high school. <laughs> Surprisingly, a lot of the research for this already exists. <laughs> Lots of different swallow species live in Africa, but only two are named after the continent. Since hardly any data exists for those subspecies, you can safely use the data from its European cousin, the barn swallow, which has an extensive research done on it and is very alike to African swallows. Alright, now for the technical part. Barn swallows are generally 15 to 20 centimeters long, depending on age and sex, with a wingspan of 12.2 centimeters. When they are fully grown, barn swallows have a body mass of approximately 20 grams. Sadly, this shuts down the idea that the bird is 5 ounces. By comparing this information with several other similar birds, you can deduce the frequency, 15 beats per second, and the amplitude, about 22 centimeters per beat. According to Graham Taylor, an expert on birds, the speed of a flying animal is approximately three times frequency by amplitude, so the equation is U equals 3 FA. <laughs> Plug in the numbers, round the answers, and you find that the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow is 10 to 11 meters per second, or 24 miles per hour. It's kind of anticlimactic. <laughs> <laughs> this answers the question from the film, but I wanted to add a coconut into the mix to complete the plot. So coconuts grow rampant on tropical sea coasts, especially near salt water. It also helps to have little to no precipitation. This map shows the rainfall in Africa. In the north, where our swallow lives, you can see there are only few spots along the coast where there's little rainfall, in yellow. 
Swallows have also been found to roost near humans, so I found this map that shows the urban densities in northern Africa. The highest populations, in red, occur near the Nile Delta, which also receives very little rainfall. Therefore, you can conclude that swallows are likely to live near the Nile Delta, which is also an area where coconuts grow. Coincidence? Probably, but just overlook that. <laughs> Now that you know that swallows and coconuts exist in the same area, you can find out whether or not a swallow can carry one. Unfortunately, one cannot. As they say in the Holy Grail, a five-ounce bird cannot carry a one-pound coconut. That made me sad. I was stumped. It wouldn't work after all the extensive research. But then I realized that Patsy, Arthur's manservant, wasn't clapping together two coconuts. He was clapping two halves of a coconut together. So I got out a coconut shell and waited, because we all have coconut shells laying around our houses. <laughs> it masks to about 85 grams. Now, there's a bunch of math here that really doesn't make sense, so I'm not going to bore you with that. But basically, you divide it out, and it comes to about four, which means that the coconut would be on a string between four birds. Highly impossible to be sure, but still possible. <laughs> Monty Python was a group of brilliant entertainers who obviously thought out their seemingly random skits. As of today, only five of the Pythons remain, having lost Graham Chapman in 1989. Even now, they are still performing around the world at venues that sell out and keeping the legacy alive. Thank you.